Welcome back, everyone. This is Dr. Gonstein, and we're here again with lecture number 12. Okay, so with this lecture, we're going to continue in this section of the class, as we've been on for a couple lectures now, where we're learning how to solve the omitted variable bias problem. In lecture number 10, we introduced the perfect way, or the, I should say the best way, and that, would, and that is using a perfect experiment. Uh, but we don't always have that luxury. And so now we're using or we're looking at these quasi-experimental methods that in a certain sense mimic randomization and allow us to identify uh, causation, allows us to solve that admitted variable bias problem. In lecture number 11, we looked at propensity square matching, one of those methods. Here in lecture number 12, we'll be talking about two methods, natural experiments and instrumental variables. We'll look at two because there's some ways in which these, uh, in which these can overlap. Okay, and with that, let's begin. Uh, so again, just as a reminder, when we don't have a randomly assigned variable, what we are often going to use is a quasi-experimental method. A quasi-experimental method is where we use uh, econometrics and uh, other techniques to try to mimic randomization or p uh, to mimic random assignment. In this course, I talk about a couple of these techniques. The first was propensity score matching, which we went over in the last lecture. Today, we're going to talk about natural uh, experiments and instrumental variables. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about difference in differences. Okay, so let's do a little bit of intuition on these two methods and then go into them separately. So intuition. So randomization allows us to achieve statistical independence. Uh, which eliminates the omitted variable bias. You remember that statistical independence uh, basically implies that the treatment variable is not correlated with other variables. Um, or another way of putting it is that the treatment group is the same as the control group on average. But in the absence of randomization, um, we might fall victim to this omitted variable bias because our treatment variable, the variable that we're really interested in, will probably be endogenous. It will probably be correlated with other variables, including variables excluded from the model, which means we'll have omitted variable bias. When we did propensity square matching, we used the intuition that, um, that when a treatment variable is randomized, that the treatment group is the same as the control group. And so we said, well, why don't we just match people in the treatment group to people in the control group? And uh, if we match them, we can mimic that characteristic. So that was the intuition behind the propensity score matching. The intuition here behind natural experiments and instrumental variable approaches is to mimic randomization by taking advantage of some natural or otherwise similar source of exogeneity. So basically, um, to take advantage of some sort of variation in the independent variable of interest uh, that is identical to or similar to uh, randomization. So basically what we do here is, uh, let's say we want to understand the impact of x on y. Well, what we do is we look for events or phenomena that um, might induce random variation or close to random variation in x. And we use that uh, as a source of randomization. We use that to mimic real randomization. Okay, now that might sound a little bit unclear at first, but let's do some illustrations. Let me go through a, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through a number of examples. And I think that going through these examples um, will illustrate what, we, what I mean here. Okay, so that's basically the, the overview. All right, so then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and talk about natural experiments. Um, and primarily, um, I will first I'll reiterate the intuition as it relates to natural experiments explicitly. And then I'm going to go into a number of examples that I think will make this intuition more clear. Okay, so natural experiments take advantage of nat quote unquote natural sources of exogeneity. So what we do is we use events or policies or some other phenomena that randomly occur or close to randomly occur as a source of exogenous variation in the variable of interest. 
All right, so we basically use some other source of randomization, some natural source of randomization, um, instead of actually conducting an experiment. Okay, so uh, let's do a bunch of examples to try to make that clear. All right, so in the first example, uh, and as you see, I'm going to go through, like I said, several examples. And for each example, I'm going to kind of set the background. Basically, what's the research question? Um, and then we'll talk about, well, what would an experiment look like? And why can't we do an experiment in this case? Uh, and then I'll conclude by showing what a natural experiment could look like. Okay, so uh, first ex the first example. Um, this is the question of the quantity versus quality fertility model. So here's the basic idea. Here's the question that researchers might want to answer. Uh, so a common argument in the world of development practitioners is that large families uh, are a hindrance to economic development. Uh, and so the, and, and the argument stems from a very well-established trend that, um, you know, economic development typically coincides with reduced fertility. Developed countries tend to have much lower fertility than developing countries. Uh, and usually the argument goes that, that, uh, that families that have more children are able to invest less in each individual child. And so basically, if, if a family has an additional child, that will cause uh, the other children to uh, have less invested in them, particularly in education. So, so uh, a child, so let's say, uh, you know, a child is the firstborn child of a family. If that family has an additional child, the firstborn will receive less investments in their education than they would have otherwise. All right, so this is called the quantity versus quality fertility model. This idea that uh, when it comes to children and especially their education, there is a trade-off between quantity and quality. The more children you have, the less education that each child will, will achieve or attain. So there's this trade-off, this quantity versus quality trade-off. That's the idea. But now the question is, uh, do we have good evidence for this relationship? And, 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 and more specifically, uh, let's say we want to ask the question, does having more children cause reduced edu ed educational attainment per child? Okay, so we want to know, is there a causal relationship here that having additional children causes a reduction um, in educational attainment per child? Okay, so... Let's say we wanted to test this. We wanted to investigate this question. Now, we might initially be tempted to run a regression model like the one that you see here. Uh, so here, let's say uh, we have a regression model, and, and we want to know, does uh, basically, does family size, does having additional children cause, um, cause the children to get lower education, poor educational attainment? Okay, and so we're tempted to run this regression model, and this regression model would be uh, where ed the education level of, let's say, the oldest child, okay, so the education level of the oldest child is regressed on family size and then some other control variables, some other independent variables, control variables. Okay, we really want to know how does family size uh, impact education, and so we might run this regression model, and we might think that our estimate of beta 1, so our beta 1 hat, would give us an answer to the question. We want to know, okay, does uh, additional children cause uh, a reduction in education levels, and so we might expect that beta 1 hat would give us uh, the impact of family size on education. But the problem is, if we ran this model, and, and let's say we ran it, we found beta 1 hat is negative and significant. All right. And so that would seem to, to support the quantity versus quality trade-off, that if you have more children, the, uh, the quality of the education that they'll receive is lower. But we have a problem. Family size is not randomly assigned. It will be endogenous, and therefore there will almost certainly be omitted variable bias in our beta 1 hat. So this is our problem. We can't just simply run this regression because we will get a biased estimate of beta 1. And so we're not going to know the true causal impact of family size on education.
Well, then how would we do it? How would we test the quantity versus quality fertility model? Well, solution number one would be a randomized experiment. And in, in a certain way, we might argue that that's the optimal in the sense that that would allow us to identify causation. And in such a case, what we could do is we could, uh, um, you know, find families that only have one child and then randomly assign half of those families to receive an additional child and, and then mandate that the other uh, half of the families don't receive a child. All right, then we can compare the difference between the families with the additional child and the families uh, without the additional child and, um, and draw a causal conclusion about family size on education. But clearly, this would be a wildly unethical and uh, infeasible randomized experiment. This is not a question that we can answer uh, using a randomized experiment, not in an ethical, uh, morally justifiable way. So, so clearly, that's not an option in this case. Well, then what can we do? Well, another solution would be to use a natural experiment. Okay, so now in this context, using this illustration, using this example, hopefully uh, we can make it clear what a natural experiment is. Okay, so another option is to use a natural experiment to try to find the impact of family size on education. All right, so how does that work? How would a natural experiment work? Well, what we do is we want to find some source of natural random variation in family size and use that instead of an actual experiment. So we have to think, what could be a natural source, a natural source of random variation in family size? Is there something that we could use? Is there some source of variation? that we could use uh, that would allow us, that, that allow us to say that um, that could mimic randomization basically. Well, there is a way that has been used several times in the academic literature um, on this question. And so, uh, and, and this is it. What researchers have claimed or have observed is that twins, is that when a mother has twins, the fact that she has twins rather than a single child is at least somewhat random. It's at least close to random. That a mother uh, might have twins, and, and that's somewhat of a random phenomenon. Most often, parents have a single child at the time, but every once in a while, Seeming, seemingly by chance, seemingly randomly, families might have twins. Okay, now if parents having twins is random, or at least really close to random, there might be some factors that affect whether or not a parent has twins, but it's close to random. So if having twins is close to random, then we can use the incidence of twins as a source of random variation in, in, in family size. Basically, what we can do, actually, and let me use this illustration here to illustrate it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this random phenomenon of having twins, this natural random phenomenon of having twins, as a source of random variation in, in family size. So let's do a natural experiment. What we can do is we can find a population of families that have at least two children. And then we investigate the impact uh, of families that have second birth twins on the oldest child's educational level. Okay, so let me be clear. We're basically going to have treatment families and control families. All right. All the families in our sample are going to have um, a firstborn child, and they're all going to have a second birth. Okay, but our treatment families, basically our treatment families, are going to be families in which that second birth was a pair of twins, and we can say that uh, that basically parents have twins randomly. And so these families that have twins, they basically have a randomly assigned, in a sense, they have a randomly assigned additional child. They have a randomly assigned additional child. Their family size is exogenously larger. <laughs> 
So the treatment families are families that have twins in the second birth, and the control families are families that have a single child at the second birth. And so the treatment families have a randomly assigned additional child. The treatment families have a larger family size than the control families. And so what we will do is we will compare the educational outcomes for the firstborn children between the treatment families and the control families. And by doing that, we have some exogenous variation in family size. The treatment families have one additional child than the control families, and it was assigned randomly. Not it is it is exogenous, not endogenous. And so, therefore, we will compare treatment families to control families. This is a natural experiment. It's an experiment that uh, occurred because of randomization in nature. That's one kind of natural experiment. Okay, so what we can do, so let's just consider the following model. So instead of using family size as the independent variable of interest, we use twins. The twins variable equal one if the family had twins during the second birth. We find the impact of twins on educational achievement of the oldest child. Having twins should be close to random, so there should be no omitted variable bias. If beta 1 is negative and significant, there is a quantity quality trade off. If it is insignificant, there is no trade off. Angrist et al., 2010, did an experiment very similar to this. They used a natural experiment using twins, and they found no evidence of a quantity quality trade off using twins as natural variation or natural experiment. Okay, so that is the first example. Let me move to another. Actually, let me summarize real quick. So basically, there, this, this example that we just went through using twins as a natural experiment is an example of when nature itself can provide a source of randomization. And so if, if we're looking to do a natural experiment, one source of random variation can be nature itself, natural events. Twins are a natural event. There's other kinds of natural events. I'm going to do one more example of, a nat of using a natural event as a source of random variation. All right, the second one is going to be the discovery of oil. All right, so in this example, and I'm drawing this from a paper, uh, Vicente, uh, 2010. Okay, this question relates to what's called the curse of natural resources. Here's the idea. Uh, development practitioners have been concerned that in developing countries, natural resources can be a source of corruption that can hinder economic development rather than help. That basically there might be a curse of natural resources. But now we have to ask ourselves the question, do natural resources, do having access to natural resources cause corruption? in developing countries? Does it cause corruption? So there might be some correlation between, between natural resources and corruption in the developing world, but that doesn't imply causation. We want to know, do natural resources cause corruption? All right. Uh, Pedro Vicente tried to answer this question using a natural experiment that is based on a natural event, the discovery of oil. All right. So it's very difficult to measure the causal impact of natural resources, such as oil, on corruption. So to test the, uh, the curse of natural resources, we might be tempted to run um, what we might call the naive, a naive regression model, in which we use some measure of corruption as the as the, in, uh, the dependent variable, and then we use some level of natural resources as the independent variable of interest, as well as some control variables. Now, if the curse of natural resources is true, we could run this regression, and we might, um, and we might find that beta 1 hat is negative significant. But the problem is, is that resources is not randomly assigned. And so it will be endogenous, and therefore there will almost certainly be omitted variable bias, just like before. And so we can't just simply run this regression model. We will get biased results.
Now, the best, the best way of solving this would be a randomized experiment. Now, what we could do is we could go to, we could find countries that have little to no natural resources and then um, give, randomly assign half of them to receive natural resources uh, and then compare them and use that, use a real experiment to study the impact of natural resources on, on corruption. But the problem is, is that's impossible. And so we can't use a randomized experiment in this context. But perhaps we could use a natural experiment. How would this work? So this is uh, what Visante did. Um, he said, the discovery of oil can be seen as at least partially random, somewhat random. In advance, we don't necessarily know where oil is located. Oil has to be searched for. And so um, in a sense, whether or not a country discovers oil within its territory can be somewhat random. And so what Visante does is takes advantage of this at least somewhat random discovery of oil. He chooses two countries in West Africa, two developing countries in West Africa, two small island countries, Sao Tome and Principe and Cape Verde. These countries are extremely similar in their histories, economies, and demographics. And what he attempts to do is to use a natural experiment to identify the impact of the discovery of oil, aka natural resources, on corruption. So he recognizes this, that in 1997, Sautame and Principe announced that they discovered oil. And so if they compare uh, Sautome and Principe to Cape Verde, shortly after the discovery of oil, this can be a natural experiment. The two nations should be comparable on average, yet one has an exogenous increase in natural resources due to the discovery of oil. So consider the following model. In this model, instead of using just natural resources as the independent variable of interest, what they do is use Sautame and Principe as the independent variable of interest. Here, the author, authors use household data from the two countries. Sao Tome and Principe equals 1 if the household is from that country, and 0 if they're from Cape Verde. As long as these populations are comparable on average without the oil, then this analysis should provide an impact of natural resource wealth on corruption. So as long as, before the d discovery of the oil, these two countries were very similar, and they were, and as long as the populations are very similar between the two countries, then this discovery of oil should allow us to identify the impact of natural resource wealth on corruption. Okay, so there, there are, those are two examples of natural experiments stemming from natural events. The first was the phenomenon of parents having twins. The second is the discovery of oil. Both of these are examples of natural events being sources of um, at least random or close to random variation in the dependent variable that we're interested in. Okay, now I'm going to do one more example of a natural experiment. And in this case, I'm going to use a different source of variation. Another common source of variation um, is the implementation of government policies. Sometimes the implementation of government policies and where and when these government policies come into effect can be used as a source of random or close to random variation and uh, therefore a source of natural experiment. And so let me do one example of a policy change um, that, can be, that can be utilized as a natural experiment. Okay, this example is going to come from uh, the issue of child care policy, and specifically uh, the issue of uh, women's um, labor market participation. Okay, what does that mean? So economists and policymakers are interested in understanding the factors that affect a woman's um, participation in the labor force. To determine the, the, the you know, to, to investigate the, 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 the determinants of the factors that influence whether or not a woman uh, works or does not work.
And a common question is related to um, how the cost of childcare affects whether or not a woman enters the workforce. Okay, so economists and policymakers have been very interested in trying to study this question. And they might want to study this question because they might be interested in knowing um, you know, whether or not it makes sense to implement policies to uh, promote um, or to reduce childcare costs in order to promote um, labor market participation by women. Okay, and so to try to answer this question, we might be tempted to run a regression like what you see here where we have a woman's employment status as the dependent variable and then the child care costs that she faces as well as control variables. So in this case employed equals one for women that are employed. Uh, child care cost is the cost of child care, av uh, child care available to the woman and the other variables are control variables. So if we run this model uh, we're most likely to find that beta one hat is negative significant. Basically, the higher the health care, uh, the, the higher the child care costs, the less likely it is for the woman to be employed. But again, we have a problem because child care costs are not randomly assigned. They'll be endogenous. There will almost certainly be omitted variables, and therefore omitted variable bias. So we can't simply run this what we could say naive model. We have to somehow address the, 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 the omitted variable bias in the child care cost variable. Now, of course, the best way would be to use a randomized experiment to randomly assign some parents, uh, perhaps some parents to get a child care voucher and some parents not to. And that's actually a feasible randomized experiment. However, if we're not in a position to conduct such an experiment, we have to recourse to some other method. One possible alternative method is to use a natural experiment. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of give uh, an illustration of a possible natural experiment using uh, Canada as an example. This is based loose, loosely off of, a, uh, off of a paper that does a more nuanced uh, a, approach. I'm, I'm going kind of a stylized um, representation of this. Okay, so let me use uh, a policy change in Canada as an illustration of how I could use a policy change as a natural experiment. Okay, so in the Quebec province of Canada, the provincial government started a program in 1997 that offered generous child care subsidies to mothers in Quebec. The introduction of this new policy created the opportunity for a natural experiment. This is how this might work. If, imagine that we take a sample of families that live right along the border of Quebec and another province. We take a sample of families that live right on the border. Half of our sample comes from families that live on the Quebec side of the border, and half of our families come from uh, families that live on the other side of the border. Because we're using sample, because we're using a sample that is taken right along the border, it might be reasonable to assume, and of course we could verify, that these families are the same on average. However, the families on the Quebec side have access to subsidized health care, whereas families on the other side of the province do not. We might be able to exploit that difference as a source of, uh, as a, as a source of exogenous variation in uh, child care subsidies, child care costs. Okay, so, uh, so let's just reiterate that. Let's imagine that we collect a sample of, of data from families that live right on the border. These families, because they live right on the border, are very similar. They have very, very similar characteristics, similar demographic characteristics, similar cultural characteristics, etc. However, now because of the policy change, Mothers on the Quebec side of the border have access to subsidized, low-cost uh, child care. 
whereas mothers on the other side of the border do not have access to low-cost child care. And so now what we could do is we could use this policy change that occurred in Quebec as a source of variation. Now, instead of using childcare costs as our independent variable of interest, we will use Quebec as our independent variable of interest, using the sample of data for families that live right along the border. As long as the populations are comparable on either side of the border, this model should provide us with an estimate of the impact of lower childcare costs on women's employment. Let's make a quick typo correction. Okay. And so what we've done here is we've taken advantage of this policy change. We've taken advantage of this policy change and we've used it as a, a way of mimicking randomization. We're saying that families on either side of this border are pretty much the same and then one side of the border gets a policy change, the other side of the border does not, and therefore we use that as a source of variation. Uh, we basically can say that the treatment group that the treatment group I I here is basically the, uh, the families that live in Quebec, and the control group are the families that live uh, outside of Quebec. And so now we just compare the treatment and control families, and that will be an estimate of the impact of lower childcare costs on women's employment. Okay, so to summarize, natural experiments use natural events or policy changes as source of random, as sources of random or close to random variation in the independent variable of interest. And it uses that to find unbiased impacts. And we saw three examples of natural experiments: twins, the discovery of oil, and childcare policy change. Each example used the change in the economic environment to identify unbiased impacts of the independent variable of interest which were family size, natural resource endowments, and childcare costs, respectively. So these are natural experiments. We take advantage of some, some exogenous variation to identify the impact of the variable of interest. How, does the, how do the econometrics work? Well, the easiest way to conduct an econometric analysis using a natural experiment is to simply use the natural random quote-unquote treatment variable in place of the independent variable of interest. So, and that's what we saw in each of our examples. In our first example, instead of using family size, we, we, we took a sample of households that had two or more children, and then we used the twins variable as the independent variable instead. This became kind of our natural treatment variable. And we, we said this will allow us to get an unbiased impact of family size on education. In our second example, instead of using just natural resources, we, took a, we, we selected a sample of basically of two countries, Sao Tome and Principe and Cape Verde that are very similar on average. And then we used Sao Tome and Principe as our treatment variable because they had just discovered oil. All right, so we're using our natural treatment variable instead of the variable of interest. All right, in our last example, uh, instead of using childcare costs, which we know will be endogenous, we used a sample population of people that lived right on the border so that they're comparable, and then we used Quebec as our, ran our natural treatment variable. Okay, so in these examples, we replace the endogenous variable of interest with a variable that is at least close to randomly assigned by nature itself or by a policy change. Now you may notice that it, this approach is at times comparable to estimating the ITT from a randomized experiment with imperfect compliance. Let me just make that clear. So take the child care example, um, child care example from Canada. Not every mother in Quebec will make use of subsidized child care, and some mothers outside Quebec will manage to enroll their children in subsidized uh, child care despite not being from Quebec. Child care. 
All right. This is comparable to imperfect compliance from an actual randomized experiment. So using a natural, a natural experiment approach in this way may achieve an underestimate of the true impact, just like we have um, when we estimate the ITT with imperfect compliance. So more commonly, these natural treatment variables are used as instrumental variables. And so we will turn to instrumental variables next. All right, instrumental variables. This is the second method in this lecture. I'm combining these two because they kind of follow the same logic or the same intuition. And therefore, I think that they, um, they, they, they flow together well. So we've just done natural experiments where we're saying that we use some exogenous variation from nature or from policy changes. Uh, there can be other examples um, as a source of kind of quasi-randomization, kind of to mimic randomization. Instrumental variables uses a very similar logic and follows a very particular econometric uh, methodology, which, I'll now, uh, which I will now discuss. All right, so instrumental variable approach works in a similar way as natural experiments. With the instrumental variable approach, we seek to find a variable that is exogenous but highly correlated with the endogenous treatment variable. We then use the, the exogeneity of this other variable as a means of identifying the desired treatment effect. Okay, so the, the basic intuition, the foundational intuition is very, very similar. We're basically using something that isn't the endogenous independent variable, something else that is correlated with the endogenous independent variable, but is itself exogenous. Let me be more clear. Okay, so if a treatment variable or you know, the independent variable that we're interested in, like family size, for example, if it's not randomly assigned, it is likely to be endogenous, right? And so endogenous means that it's going to be correlated with the error term and there's probably going to be omitted variable bias. And so now the, the question here with, with instrumental variables is, what if we could find a variable that is correlated with the treatment, that is correlated with this independent variable that we're interested in, but is not correlated with the error term? That's the idea. If we could find such a variable, we could use this as a measure of the impact. We could use this to measure the impact of the treatment. We call such a variable an instrument, or an instrumental variable, or just an IV, IV being the abbreviation for instrumental variable. OK, so that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to find an exogenous variable that's correlated with the endogenous variable. But to make that more clear, I'm going to keep going on this intuition. All right, so consider the example from earlier in the lecture. We want to know if more children causes lower educational attainment. So here's the regression that we saw earlier. In this case, the family size is endogenous. And therefore, there's going to be omitted variable bias in the regression. And so we can try to solve this by finding some other variable, let's call it z, that is highly correlated with family size, but is exogenous. It's exogenous. It's not going to be correlated with the error term. It's basically, it's a variable that's not going to suffer from, from omitted variable bias. It's a variable that is, in a sense, uh, randomly assigned or very close to randomly assigned. So in this case, this variable z, this other variable that's correlated with family size but is exogenous, this, this variable z we can use as an instrumental variable. Now, you might be uh, thinking intuitively here, and, and correctly so, that when we did the natural experiment, we used twins instead of family size. Well, twins, if a family has twins, that could potentially be used as an instrumental variable, a variable that is correlated with a family's, uh, with a family's family size, uh, but is itself exogenous, because whether or not... Uh, a family has twins is somewhat random. Okay, so that is the intuition. But now let me go, let me take it even a step farther that I think might help make it even more clear. So we can think about the instrumental variable approach uh, by thinking about a causal chain. 
What do I mean by this? An instrumental variable is a variable that should have some causal impact on the treatment variable, on the independent variable of interest. Okay, so here I'm going to be using, I'm going to use the word treatment variable to refer to the variable of interest. So family size or child care costs um, or natural resource endowment. That's the treatment variable. That's the variable. I want to know the impact of that variable, this uh, independent variable of interest or treatment variable. Okay, so this causal chain, what do I mean? I mean that the instrumental variable causes a change in the treatment variable. Basically, this instrumental variable has a causal effect on the treatment variable. All right. And then the treatment variable has a causal impact, has a causal relationship with the outcome variable that we're interested in. All right, so I'm going to use letters throughout this. Z is going to be my instrumental variable. Okay. And we're saying that this instrumental variable Z has a causal impact. It impacts the treatment variable, the independent variable of interest, okay, which we're going to label with T. So Z has a causal relationship with T. Z causes T to change. All right. And then T, this independent variable of interest, this treatment variable, has a causal impact on Y, the dependent variable, the, 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 the outcome variable that we are interested in looking at. So, so using the example that we did above, we're basically saying that if a family has twins, this is our instrument, that if a family has twins, that causes the family size to be larger. And then we're saying that the family size has an impact on education. So there's this causal chain. The instrument causes an impact on the treatment variable, and the treatment variable causes uh, an impact on the outcome variable uh, that we're interested in. Okay, but the problem is, is that the treatment variable, or using our example family size, is endogenous. And so, and so we can't just analyze the impact of T on Y. We can't just analyze the impact of family size on education because they're endogenous. There's going to be omitted variable bias. And so instead, what we do is we use this other variable, this Z, or twins, this variable that is, um, that is exogenous, this variable that um, is correlated with its it causes a change in the treatment variable, but it is itself not correlated with, with any omitted variables. All right. So we're saying that Z, or in our example, twins, is exogenous. Okay. So Z, or twins, they cause an impact on T, family size. And then family size can have an impact on education, or T can have an impact on Y. But T is endogenous. T is correlated with a bunch of other things. But if we can find a Z, if we can find an instrumental variable that is exogenous, it's not correlated with other variables, that basically a Z that's randomly assigned or close to randomly assigned, like something from a natural experiment, then we can use it. We can use that instead. We can use that to try to measure the impact of the treatment on the outcome variable. So we basically, we could use twins as an instrumental variable, okay? Because twins has a causal impact on family size, and then family size can have a causal impact on education. So we use these variables, these exogenous variables, instead of the endogenous variables. Okay, so now that is, that is our intuition. We use the exogeneity of Z to find the effect of T on Y. That's, that's our intuition. We're taking advantage that, of this Z variable that, has, that is exogenous to find the impact of T on Y. That's the intuition. Okay. Now, 
like every other method that we use here, there are some assumptions. We have to make some assumptions for this method to hold. This method, instrumental variables, is a very powerful method. It's probably the most powerful method that we have in our, uh, at our disposal when we want to find the causal impact of, 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 a, of a variable, of, an, of a variable that's not randomly assigned. If we want to find the causal impact of a variable that's not random, um, our probably our most powerful tool is to use an instrumental variable approach okay but now like every other method that we have used and will use the method comes with assumptions we need to be able to validate those assumptions those assumptions must hold if those assumptions do not hold then we will not get unbiased estimates Okay, so then let's pay very careful attention to what the assumptions are. This really is going to be where our focus is. We need to understand what the assumptions are and whether or not they hold. So remember, whenever we use a quasi-experimental approach, we always need to think about the assumptions. So let's talk about the assumptions that we use when using an instrumental variable approach. All right, there are three main assumptions. And then later I'll introduce a fourth that, it, that we appeal to in particular contexts. So here are the three main assumptions. The first assumption is called relevance. The relevance assumption says this. The instrumental variable is correlated with the treatment variable. Or using that causal, uh, that causal chain framework I was just using, the instrumental variable has a causal impact on the treatment variable. This is the idea that our instrumental variable has to be related to the treatment. It's very clear from our example of twins. Twins are related to family size. If a family has twins, they're probably more likely to have a larger family size. So that would be an example of an instrumental variable that is correlated with the treatment, correlated with the independent variable of interest. All right, so relevance is just saying that there is this, this link between the instrumental variable and the treatment variable. All right, the second assumption is independence. This says that the instrumental variable is not correlated with the error term. That means the instrumental variable does not suffer from omitted variable bias. If we, if we were to include the instrumental variable instead of the treatment variable, there would be a, there would be no omitted variable bias because it's exogenous. It's not correlated with other things. This is basically saying that the instrumental variable is random or uh, is close to random. It resembles random. Okay, the last assumption is called the exclusion restriction assumption. The exclusion restriction assumption says this. The instrumental variable has no impact on the dependent variable directly. It only impacts the dependent variable through its impact on the treatment variable. This basically goes back to the causal chain argument. The, the exclusion restriction assumption says that twins, having twins, does not affect the educational attainment of the, of, of the, of the children in the family, except through its impact on family size. So basically, we're saying that there's no arrow that goes directly from twins to education. There's no arrow that goes directly from Z to Y. The only connection between Z and Y is through T. That the only way that Z can affect Y is because Z affects T. That's the exclusion restriction assumption. Now, oftentimes, when you see discussion of instrumental variables, um, people will, will pool the assumption two and three into one and call it exogeneity. So uh, you can see that elsewhere, where sometimes, sometimes they'll say that the assumptions of the instrumental variable are relevance and exogeneity, where exogeneity kind of captures the independence and exclusion restriction assumptions. OK, so those are the three assumptions. Now, um, taking those assumptions, the first thing I want to do here, take the assumptions, and I want to um, 
uses assumptions to kind of illustrate, to, to reinforce our intuition and to illustrate what's happening kind of at, at an intuitive level when we use instrumental variables to estimate treatment effects. Okay, so again, we want to know, just generalize here, we want to know the impact of T on Y. We want to know the impact that the, this treatment variable, this independent variable of interest, has on Y. Okay, so that would be, we want to know the impact of family size on um, the children's educational attainment. Okay, but now what we're doing is we're going to use Z. We're going to use the exogeneity of Z. We're going to use the fact that Z is independent and, um, uh, and satisfies the exclusion restriction. We're going to use that to capture the effect of T on Y. All right, how do we do that? Well, this is actually how we do it. We can say that the impact of T on Y, the impact of the treatment variable on Y, is equal to this. The impact of Z on Y divided by the impact of Z on T. This is the intuition behind the instrumental variable approach. The impact of T on Y is equal to the impact of Z on Y divided by the impact of Z on T. How does this work? Well, first, this uh, this utilizes our assumptions. It utilizes the three assumptions. How does it do it? Well, the denominator here is the impact of Z on T. Z will have an impact on T if the relevance assumption holds. So if the relevance assumption is true, then Z will have an impact on T. All right? The top, the numerator, the impact of Z on Y, if independence holds, then the impact of Z on Y will be unbiased. We'll be able to estimate, without bias, the impact of Z on Y. And if the exclusion restriction holds, then this effect comes only from the impact of T on Y. Remember, the exclusion restriction says that the only way that Z impacts Y is because Z has an impact on T. And so basically what we do is we capture the impact of Z on Y, and then we divide that by the impact that Z has on T. And that gives us an estimate of the impact of T on Y. All right, so that's the intuition behind the instrumental variable approach and why it's essential to have these three assumptions. Okay, uh, just to make this a little bit more mathematical, I want to reinforce the first two assumptions. Uh, the, first two, the, first assum the, the first assumption is relevance. This is basically saying that there is correlation between T and Z, between the treatment variable and the, and the um, instrument, and that there's independence. That means Z is not correlated with epsilon, the error term. Okay, so now, having laid down that intuition, having laid down the assumption, the assumptions, let me illustrate how we, how we utilize instrumental variables in practice. So illustrate the regression uh, methodology. And then from there, we'll talk about how to validate the assumptions. Okay, so using an instrumental variable, what we do is we use a particular kind of regression model called a two-stage least squares. The two-stage least squares regression model is a regression framework that has, as you as is probably rather clear, two stages. All right, so the two-stage least squares uses a two-step or two-stage approach to get unbiased estimates of the treatment effect, unbiased estimates of, of the variable of interest on the outcome. Okay, so how does this work? Well, stage one is called the first stage. Uh, shocking name. Stage one is called the first stage. And what this is, is we run a regression of, of T, the treatment variable, regressed on Z, the instrumental variable. And this regression basically captures the first step in that causal chain. So remember, this is our causal chain. We're saying that Z causes an impact on T, T causes an impact on Y. The first stage is capturing this first link in the causal chain. So what we're doing is we run a regression of T on Z. This is meant to capture the impact of Z on T.
All right, we will get an estimate, alpha 1. And because z is exogenous, uh, this should be an unbiased estimate of the impact of z on t. So we run this regression, and then we use the results from that regression. We basically use alpha hat, al uh, you know, alpha alpha zero hat, and alpha one hat times z. We use we we generate we use the results of this regression to generate a predicted treatment variable. All right, we generate a predicted treatment variable. Then we use that generated predicted that predicted treatment variable in stage two. Okay, stage two is called the reduced form. Okay, stage two is called the reduced form. What we do is we take in, okay instead of running a regression of y on t. That would be our naive model, right? That would be the model that has endogeneity, omitted variable bias. Instead of doing that, we replace t with t hat. We take t hat and we plug it into the regression instead of t. So instead of using t, we use t hat. We use the predicted treatment variable from the first stage. Then we will run this regression, we'll get beta 1 hat, and this will be an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect. All right, so let me go into some, let me try to give some intuition, a little bit deeper intuition here on this. So from the first stage, what we're doing is we're regressing the treatment variable on Z, the instrumental variable. In this regression, the error term captures all the variation in T that is not correlated with Z. All right, so all the correlation, all the variation in T that's not correlated with Z goes into the error term. That's a good thing. So then what we do when we, when we predict T, what we're doing is we're throwing away all the variation in T that is not correlated with Z. We're basically creating an exogenous treatment variable. We're using Z to create an exogenous treatment variable. Remember, Z is exogenous. It's independent. It's not correlated with other things. T is. That's our problem. So by running a regression of T on Z and then generating a predicted value of T, we're getting rid of the endogeneity. We're basically creating an exogenous treatment variable. That's what T hat is. It's basically an exogenous treatment variable. So then we take t hat, we plug it in, and t hat includes all the variation in z, but excludes everything else. So now, ta now t hat will be exogenous because the endogeneity has been removed. All right, that's, that's the intuition and that's the protocol. We use two stage least squares. It has two steps. We capture basically the two different stages in that causal chain. We capture the first stage of the causal chain here. So the first stage captures the first link in the causal chain. And then the second stage captures the second link in the causal chain. Okay. All right. Now, this is going to give us an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect only if the assumptions hold, right? So I can't impress this upon you enough. We have to validate the assumptions. We have to be able to say that our assumptions hold. If they don't, then we throw, them, we throw this approach out. It doesn't work. We can't use the approach if we don't have valid assumptions. Okay, so then we got to think, how do we validate these assumptions? Now, uh, there are some formal and informal way of validating these assumptions. I'm mostly going to focus on the informal ways. Uh, here in this lecture. All right, so let's talk about the three assumptions and how we might validate those assumptions. The first assumption is relevance. This is this is you know this is related to the first link in the causal chain. This is the idea that z is is related to t. Z is correlated with t. Z impacts t. Z can cause a change in t. All right, the instrumental variable causes a change in t. All right, how do we test that? Well, in this case, what we can do is we can run our first stage regression model. We regress T on Z. All right, we run this first stage regression model, this one here. We regress T on Z. All 
And then we look at that regression model. We look at the results of that regression model. I'll do this in the Stata demo. Um, we look at the results of that regression model, um, and we use those results to get an idea of whether or not re uh, uh, relevance holds. Now, let's just think about it. If Z really does cause an impact on T, if they're really strongly correlated, then we should find that alpha 1 hat, the coefficient on Z, should be statistically significant. And we should also find that the regression does a decent job of explaining variation in T. And so we can use two ways of doing that. We can use the, the F statistic for the first stage regression, which should be greater than 10. That's our threshold. Uh, and also, the instrumental variable, Z, should be significant in the first stage regression. All right, so that's the relevance. I'll demo that. The second, the second assumption is independence. Now, independence, if we only have one instrumental variable, we cannot test independence formally. Okay, so, uh, and oftentimes we only have one instrumental variable, and so that's what I'm going to focus on here. Um, we can't test this formally if we only have one independent variable. But we could try to informally test it. One way of doing that is to do a balancing test where we compare um, the group that has the instrumental variable to the group that doesn't. We use a standard balancing test across the IV groups um, where we should find that the, the group that has the instrumental variable uh, should be uh, similar, comparable on average, to the group that doesn't. But the best argument is conceptual. The best argument is to use our intuition, to use logic reasoning, to uh, validate this assumption. We should be able to argue that the instrumental variable is random, or at, at least uh, mimics randomization. For example, if we use twins as an instrumental variable, we should be able to argue that it's independent. And we can argue that because whether or not uh, a family has twins is somewhat biologically random. It's not totally random, but it's pretty close. OK, so that would be the independence variable. And then exclusion restriction. Again, we can't test this formally. Kind of a bad informal test would be to run a regression of y the, out, the dependent variable regress y on t and z. And if z is significant, then this would be evidence against the exclusion restriction assumption. It's not a great, it's not, it's not a great even informal test, though. Um, you might expect t and z to have high multicollinearity. It might be insignificant for other reasons. Um, so it's not a great test. It, we can do it to kind of get an informal idea. Uh, it certainly would be bad news if z was significant in such a regression. Uh, because that would mean that Z has some statistically significant relationship with Y, even when controlling for T. Um, so that would not be good. But it's not a great test. Uh, again, the best validation is a sound conceptual argument. You need to be able to make a sound uh, conceptual intuitive argument for why the instrumental variable satisfies the exclusion restriction. Now, when we have more than one um, instrumental variable, there are some formal statistical tests that we can use, but I'm not going to consider them here. All right. So, uh, here, let me give an example of, of, of a paper that uses an instrumental variable to give us an idea of what this can look like in practice. Uh, so, uh, in Angris 1990, uh, the authors were interested in looking at the impact of, of veteran status on civilian earnings. Basically, the idea is this. We want to know how does serving in the United States military affect people's earnings after they return from the military? Is serving in the military uh, you know, a good way of boosting your wages after you get out of the military? And this might be particularly important if we want to know the effect of, of military service on, um, or military service, uh, active military duty service. So basically, uh, people that have actually fought in wars. How, how does fighting in a war affect um, someone's earnings once they get out of the military?
Okay, so then, you know, uh, the naive approach might be to run a regression where we just simply regress um, people's earnings on their veteran status. So it equals one if they were a, if they're a veteran, if they served in the military, and zero if they didn't. The problem is that the problem is that the veteran status is going to have tremendous endogeneity. If you served in the military, uh, people that serve in the military basically are probably going to be very different from people that don't serve in the military, and so there's probably going to be horrible omitted variable bias. And so we can't simply just run the naive model. We've got to come up with some some other source of variation. So what Angers does, this is a classic paper, uh, what Angers does is uses data on a sample population of people um, that were of age during the Vietnam War. This was a, a war that the United States fought in, uh, in Vietnam. And what happened during the Vietnam War is that the United States had a draft. And a draft is basically um, a, a random mechanism of selecting uh, young men to serve in the military. So what the United States government did is it would randomly pick young men and then force them, basically, to serve in the military. This was called the draft. And so what they do, because, because the draft was random, because the draft was random, they used the draft as an instrumental variable. The draft itself should have no, in, uh, no effect on people's incomes, except by the fact that the draft causes an impact on whether or not people serve in the military. And so here's the basic idea. They use the draft as an instrumental variable. And they can make a strong argument. They can make a strong argument that this instrumental variable is going to satisfy the assumptions of the instrumental variable approach. And I need to make a quick adjustment here. Um, so while I lecture, I'm going to make, an, uh, make a correction. So relevance assumption holds because it's quite clear that that uh, being selected in the draft is going to have a strong impact on whether or not someone will serve in the military. So relevance is very clear. If, if your number was drawn in the draft, you're much, much more likely to serve in uh, the military. So relevance will be very strong. Definitely can satisfy the relevance assumption. Okay, the independence assumption. That's the idea that the instrumental variable is not correlated with anything else. It's not gonna, there, it's not gonna have omitted variable bias, uh, pretty much. It's not gonna be correlated with the error term. Well, that's pretty straightforward to assume that as well because the lottery was random. The government had a, a random lottery. And then the last one is the exclusion restriction. This is the idea that uh, the lottery does not impact um, individuals' earnings except by the fact that it affects their service in the military. Okay, and so they can argue the exclusion restriction holds. Uh, the draft shouldn't impact uh, earnings except by impacting military service. Okay, so I think a reasonable argument can be made that this instrumental variable will hold, that it'll be valid for the, for the three assumptions. And so they run this analysis and they find the, the effect. They find the effect of military service on civilian earnings. And it was, uh, I believe, a negative effect. Okay. I want to take this just a little bit deeper here before we move on to our Stata demo. I want to go a little bit deeper and I want to describe what's called a local average treatment effect. All right. So... A local average treatment effect is a particular kind of treatment effect that we identify when we use an instrumental variable, when we use an instrumental variable approach. Now, to understand 
this concept of a local average treatment effect, I need to discuss um, the issue of what's called compliance. Compliance. Uh, now, you'll remember from my lecture on randomization that if we have a randomized experiment, it's possible that we can have imperfect compliance. That basically, we can have a situation in which uh, there are people that were assigned to receive the treatment, didn't get the treatment, and people that weren't assigned to get the treatment did get the treatment. We can have imperfect compliance. Okay, so now to really understand the local average treatment effect, I need to go into more detail into this issue of compliance. All right, I need to go into more detail into the issue of compliance to really make it clear uh, what impact uh, we identify when we use an instrumental variable approach. Okay, so let's do it. So to fully understand the nature of our estimate from using instrumental variables, we must consider the issue of compliance and then make one more assumption. Compliance is how observations, how observations respond to the instrument. When we consider the impact of the instrument on the treatment variable, we can have four kinds of people. Now, I'm going to just uh, define these four kinds of people, and then I'll use uh, one of our examples from earlier to illustrate it because I think I'll, it'll make it more clear. But let me just define these four categories of people. The first category is called always takers. Always takers, um, or an always taker, is a person who receives the treatment regardless of the instrument. All right, I'll give an example in a minute. An always taker is a person who receives the treatment uh, regardless of the instrument. A never taker is a person who never receives the treatment regardless of the instrument. A complier is a person who receives the treatment only when the instrument compels them to. Basically, um, okay, I'll come back in just a second. Deniers. A denier is a person who receives the treatment only when the instrument does not compel them to receive it. Okay, so let's think back to that causal chain that I talked about um, a little bit earlier. So here's our causal chain. We're saying that Z has some impact on T. T has some impact on Y. Z is our instrumental variable. The instrumental variable causes some impact on T. So here's the idea. There's four kinds of people. Always takers, never takers, compliers, and deniers. Always takers are people for whom Z has no impact on T. They always get the treatment. They always get the treatment. Doesn't matter what Z is. Z has no impact on T for always takers. Then there's never takers. Z has no impact on never takers. They never get the treatment regardless of what Z is. Those are never takers. Then there's compliers. For compliers, Z impacts T. For compliers, Z causes them to receive the treatment. All right, so Z has an impact on compliers. Then there's deniers. Z has an impact on T for deniers. But it's the opposite. For deniers, Z causes them to not receive the treatment. All right, let me give an example, and I think it'll make it more clear. All right, so remember our example of childcare in Canada. Let's use this example. So we wanted to know the impact of childcare costs on mothers' employment status. So we said the mothers living in Quebec have access to subsidized child care. And I'll just add some details here just for illustration. Let's say $5 a day child care. While mothers just across the border didn't. Let's say they had to pay $20. All right, so in this case, living in Quebec would be the instrument. The cost of child care is the treatment. And then the employment status of the mother is the outcome variable. All right. So let's consider the four kinds of mothers. There's the always takers. These are the mothers who manage to pay $5 for child care, whether they live in Quebec or not. So it doesn't matter whether they live in Quebec or not, they pay $5 uh, for their child care. They're never takers. These are mothers who pay $20 for, health, for child care, regardless of whether they live in Quebec or not. Again, living in Quebec doesn't affect them. They pay $20 no matter what. They're the never takers. 
Then there's compliers. Compliers are the mothers that pay $5 if they live in Quebec, and they pay $20 if they live outside Quebec. Compliers are the ones that we typically think of in, in assessing the impact. Compliers are the ones that are affected by, uh, by the instrument in the way that we would expect. They're basically, they're the mothers who pay $5 when they live in Quebec and they pay $20 when they don't. And then there are deniers. Deniers are mothers that pay $5 if they live outside Quebec and they pay $20 if they live inside Quebec. Deniers are the ones that, it's it's, they don't really seem to make very much sense. Who would be, you know, in this, especially in this context, a denier is, is, a, is a mother that pays $5 when they live outside Quebec, but they pay $20 when they live inside Quebec. That would be very strange. All right, so here are the examples. There's four kinds of people. We can put this into a, a, a table to kind of illustrate. So here, Z equals one. So basically, these are people that live inside Quebec. And then they can either pay $5 or they can pay $20. If they live in Quebec and they pay five dollars, they're compliers. If they live in Quebec, okay. All right. So if they live in Quebec and they pay uh, five dollars, they're compliers. If they live in Quebec, oh, I'm sorry. All right, here we go. I got it. Okay, I've got to explain the other axis. That's why this makes sense. Okay, so on this axis, we've got w whether they live in Quebec or not, and then they ha and then we have whether or not they um, pay five dollars or they um, pay twenty dollars. And then over here, we have w if they don't live in Quebec, do they pay f uh, five dollars or twenty dollars? Okay, so basically we're saying there are four kinds of people. There are four classes of people. Okay, never takers are people that if they lived in Quebec, they would still pay $20. And if they lived outside Quebec, they would pay $20. Those are the never takers. The defiers, or the deniers, defiers or deniers, I, I'm using both here. All right. The defiers are people where if they live in Quebec, they pay $20, but they live, if they live outside Quebec, they pay $5. They defy all reason. They go totally against the way that this program works. All right, those are the defiers. All right, then there are the compliers. These are the people where if they live in Quebec, they pay $5. If they live outside Quebec, they pay $20. All right, those are the compliers. And then the always takers, these are the people where they, if they live in Quebec, they pay $5. And if they live outside Quebec, they pay $5. Those are the always takers. All right. The local average treatment effect. This is what it is. This is where we use the instrumental variable. We, we use Z, Quebec, as the instrumental variable. And this allows us to identify the impact of the treatment, the impact of you know lower cost child care, on compliers. So this is known as the local average treatment effect. The impact of the impact of the treatment on compliers is the local average treatment effect. We find the local average treatment effect when we use the instrumental, when we use the uh, the exogenous variable z as an instrumental variable. All right. So if we use Quebec as an instrumental variable, we will identify what's called the local average treatment effect. The local average treatment effect is the impact of the treatment variable on those that comply with the instrument. It's the impact of subsidized child care on mothers that receive child care only because they live in Quebec. Subsidized, receive subsidized child care. So interpreted in this way, using the instrumental variable approach allows us to identify the impact of the treatment variable only on compliers. All right. We have to make one more assumption for this to be true, though. We have to make, I'm, I'm adding another assumption. This is very assumption heavy. There are no deniers or no defiers. Assumption 4 says that there are no deniers or no defiers. There is no one in the sample that does not receive the treatment because 
they received the instrument. The basically, this assumption is basically saying there is no, there are there are no mothers who would pay twenty dollars for child care if they lived in Quebec, but would pay five dollars for child care if they lived outside Quebec. There are no mothers that um, that go in the perfectly opposite direction of the of 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 the instrument. All right, this this assumption is also called monotonicity. This, this assumption is usually a fairly easy assumption to hold. Again, we, we can't support it. There's, there's, we, we can't use our data to validate it, um, but we can give an argument for it, for it based on intuition. Um, but it's a, a straightforward assumption. It's a, it's a relatively straightforward uh, assumption. Um, so we use our intuition to validate this assumption. There should not be deniers. There should not be people that uh, that v that 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 uh, violate the uh, the instrument. Okay. With all of that said, with a very long lecture, let me now go into Stata and give a demo. All right. So in this demo, I'm going to use, I'm going to uh, demonstrate how we use the instrumental variable approach. Um, the variable, this this demo might be hopefully relatively short. We're going to illustrate using the instrumental variable approach, and we're going to do it by using a data set called Wage IV. Wage IV. All right, that's the data set we're using. So let's do it. All right, lecture number fourteen instrumental variables. All right, so what I'm going to do in this data set is I'm going to take up the same question as uh, Angris, two th uh, Angris 1990. I want to see what is the impact of veteran status on people's uh, wages. Okay, does serving in the military affect uh, affect wages affect wages for uh, civilians so basically um, for people who have um, finished their service in the military alright that's what we want to do now here's the naive model naive model is we would say well let's just run a regression of wage um, on on veteran status all right here we've got this variable in the data set called veteran equals one if they've served uh, in the armed forces all right so we just run a regression of wage on veteran with education and experience and and let's just let's just do that so here's our regression here's our naive model what do I mean by naive this model uh, just uses uh, veteran status without consi con consideration of endogeneity. All right, so let's run this regression. Let's just see what we get. Well, I need to make this bigger. There we go. All right, what do we find? All right, we find uh, that wages are um, 0 0.67 dollars lower for people that are uh, veterans. But this will be uh, will be bias. This is not causal. We cannot say that being a veteran causes wages to decrease by 0 0.67. Because, because people that have served in the military will be very different 
from people that don't, or should say didn't. Okay, how do we solve this? Well, a good way would be an instrumental variable. Do we have one? Do we have an instrumental variable in our data set? Is there anything that we could say is reasonably exogenous? Well, like I said, uh, I'm going to kind of imitate uh, the Angris 1990 result here and use a variable uh, that indicates whether or not the person was randomly drafted into the military. All right, so we have a plausible, we have a, uh, a plausible IV, a plausible instrumental variable. draft. All right. This variable equals 1 if the person was drafted. All right, so let's think about our assumptions. Assumptions. Assumption 1. Whoops. Okay. Remember. Remember, always define and validate your assumptions. Okay, all right, assumption number one, relevance. All right, let's validate that assumption. Let's, first of all, let's think about it. Relevance, relevance is what? There is a relationship, essentially a causal relationship, between the IV and the treatment variable. Okay. The treatment variable is uh, veteran. The IV is draft. So first, let's think intuition. Intuition. Using our intuition, it's very clear that there will be an effect. Very clear relationship. Individuals who are drafted are much more likely to serve in the military than indiv individuals who are not. All right, um, informal data-driven method. All right, let's just run a regression of the treatment variable, veteran, on the IV draft, and then a couple control variables. All right, you'll recognize run the, you recognize that this is the first stage regression. Run the first stage regression. The first stage regression is the regression of the treatment variable onto the IV. The, the first stage captures the causal link between the instrument and the treatment. All right, so let's run this regression and see what we get. There's two things we look for. Two things we look for to validate the assumption. All right, two things we look for. The first thing is that the IV should be significant. All right, in this case, we find that draft is significant at the 1% level. Okay, check. Second thing, two. Second thing we look for, the FSTAT should be 
greater than 10. All right, where do we find that? Well, first, okay, just to make it clear, the IV should be significant. Well, here's our results. This is the coefficient on draft. Draft is the IV. It's significant at the 1% level. Okay, so the first one's check. Second, the F set should be greater than 10. Here's where Stato reports the F statistic. This is the F statistic for the whole regression. It's 719. That is way bigger than 10. All right, so both of these check out. We find an F stat of 719, which is way bigger than 10. All right, so we conclude that rele relevance holds. All right, excellent. Let's move on to the second assumption. Assumption two, independence. All right, independence. Okay, let's check independence. How does this one work? The, the, the IV should not be correlated with the error term of the main regression. All right. So basically, the IV should be exogenous or randomly assigned. All right. How do we validate this? Two, uh, two steps we might take. The first is, how do we validate? The first is intuition. Always the most important. Now I would say, because the draft is random, this IV should be, um, should be independent. All right. So that one's pretty clear. I think we can make a clean argument for that. The second, and this is informal, um, uh, we can do a balancing test. Test. So let's just do that real quick and see. So t-test, uh, we'll just grab a couple of variables. Education by draft. myself some more space here. Okay. Um, we'll do Okay. We'll do experience. We'll do female. And we'll do married. All right, let's just see if any of these are significant. We'll run them all at once. Not significant, not significant, not significant, not significant. Okay. Um, Informal check holds up. The lottery, the draft appears random. All right, good. Uh, so there we go. We validated that one. Third assumption. Assumption three, exclusion restriction. Okay. The IV only impacts the, the outcome variable through its impact on the treatment variable. Okay. Now, really the only way to do this is intuition. And this is, this is tough. Do we think that being drafted will affect your earnings in any way other than the fact that it caused you to enter the military? Um, you can make an argument either way, and you just have to make an argument. I'm going to make an argument that it doesn't. Uh, but there have been those that would argue that it does. All right, there are those that argue that it does. I'm going to make an argument that it doesn't. I'm going to say that um, this assumption holds employers are unlikely to consider uh, employees um, experience with a draft in their employ uh, employment decisions also the draft
itself should not impact um, an individual's skills. Okay, so I'm just making an argument that doesn't um, that it only impacts by by means of the treatment variable. And therefore, I'm going to just make that argument. Now, we have this other kind of method, um, a data method. We'll just, we'll just, let's just do it for fun. It's not, it's not great. All right, so we could regress wages on uh, veteran status, draft, EDU, and experience. All right, and draft should be insignificant. Draft is significant. Okay, so here's here's the problem. These two things are too closely related um, to really capture it. So, yeah, we're just not even going to bother with this method. All right, you really just need to go with intuition. You really just need to go with intuition on this exclusion restriction option. Okay. All right, so there we go. Let's move on. So we're going to say, we are going to say that... The three assumptions hold. Relevance, independence, and exclusion restriction. So now we will run our IV estimation. All right, so here's the model. The model that we use is 2SL, 2SLS, uh, two or two-staged least squares. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it first by hand, and then we're going to do it um, using a statistical, uh, a, a canned program, a command in Stata. All right, so by hand. That means I'm going to do both steps myself. First, just as a benchmark, I want to run the reduced form again. I want to I, I want to run the naive model again. So, veteran EDC experience. All right, I just want to run this again so we have this in the background. All right, so here we go. We find that uh, it's negative. The the coefficient on veteran is negative um, 0.67. All right. So now, how does this work? So we're doing this by hand. Stage one, all right, the first stage. All right, the first stage regression is a regression of the treatment variable, veteran, on to the instrumental variable, draft, and then the control variables. Okay, we regress the treatment variable on to the IV plus plus controls. Here we capture the first link in the causal chain. All right, so we run this regression. We've already run this before. We'll just run it again. And then what we do, then what we do is then we predict the treatment variable. We generate veteran hat. All right, so we'll do predict, and I'm just going to call it v hat. This is now the predicted treatment variable. This variable is basically an exogenous treatment variable. The endogenous components of the endogenous components of of the veteran variable have been removed. All right, so now Stage two, the reduced, the reduced form. Here, we regress the predicted treatment 
I'm sorry, we regress the outcome variable wages onto the predicted treatment variable. All right, so reg wages v hat plus our independent variables or control variables. And there we go. This gives us this gives us our IV estimate of the treatment effect. It also gives us the local average treatment effect. Okay, so here we go. This gives us our IV estimate of the treatment effect, also our local average treatment effect. We find that that being a veteran causes, so being a veteran causes a reduction of wages of 0 0.99 dollars per hour, which is significant at the 1% level. All right, so now this is our instrumental variable estimate. This is the this is basically an estimate. This is the local average treatment effect. This is the impact of of um, of being a veteran because you were drafted. This is the local average treatment effect. It's an unbiased estimate of the impact of being a veteran on on wages. All right, so that is my instrumental variable estimate or my local average treatment effect. Now, the last thing I'm going to do here is just run this um, is, is run this using a state of command. So using a state command. All right, we're going to use a state of command. All right, IV reg 2. And what we do is we put in the first stage veteran draft edu experience comma the I need to look this up. Sorry for the delay. But I forget. I need to remember what the code is. Okay. All right. So this is how this works. We what we do is we take the dependent variable and then all of our control variables. All right. And then we defined our first stage veteran equals our control variables and our instrumental variable. All right. And then we say we specify the endogenous variable. The endogenous variable is veteran. All right. And then we run our regression. All right. So this gives us our results. This is a state of command that will run the full step together, all the steps together. That will run the 2SLS on its own. And so here we go. We actually find that the results are very, very similar, uh, pretty much identical to having done it by hand. All right, but this is, we can just do it in one easy step using IV reg 2. Okay, so there we go.
I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and I hope that you have a great day.